all value is not created equal. Value investing is this concept where investors go and buy what is most hated, things that are probably suffering from the overreaction to bad news. And value investors go where no one else wants to go in order to generate potentially higher returns. But how does one exactly go about measuring value? What is the gauge that people use in order to measure this fear that other investors have? Now, spoiler alert, all these investments have their benefits and drawbacks, and sometimes it can feel like a game of whack-a-mole when choosing a specific measurement. At the same time, even though these specific measurements might have some sort of issues with them, there must be one that is generally better than the others. And so that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna investigate which measurement of value does a better job at capturing that premium. Value investing by its very nature has to compare two numbers together. And I talk about this analogy where value investing is comparable to going shopping. Well, the first number you pay attention to when going shopping is the price tag. What am I paying for this thing? Price in it by itself is not a measure of value. If I were to ask you to pay $20,000 for something, well, it really depends on what it is. If I asked you to pay $20,000 for a car, you think that might be a fair price. But if I asked you to pay $20,000 for a box of, say, cereal, you would not likely take that bargain because it's not a bargain. It's a, it's not a bargain. <laughs> However, if I asked you, for example, to pay $20,000 and I would give you an apartment in Brickle, then yeah, you would look for $20,000 anywhere so that you could buy that apartment at such a bargain. Therefore, there, there does need to be a second number that is juxtaposed to the price in order to determine the value of the purchasing of something. In this case, that number could be anything from quantity to quality, to usefulness, but we need to quantify what it is that we're actually purchasing. So there's two numbers, what it is that we're paying and what it is that we're buying. In the 1992 paper, The Cross-Section of Expected Returns, Eugene Fama and Kenneth French established the framework for the Fama French three-factor model, where they find that two easily measured variables, size and book-to-market equity, combine to capture the cross-sectional variation in average stock returns. Ever since then, book-to-market has been considered the OG of valuation metrics, and academics have fallen in love with this metric. Aww. And the logic here is that the assets of a company are the things that are used to create value or earnings. And the book to market ratio is the book value per share divided by the market price of each share. And book value is just the accounting metric for equity, or simply put, balance sheet assets minus balance sheet liabilities. In the case of book to market, the greater the ratio, the cheaper the company since you're paying less money for more equity. And the price to book ratio is just a variation whereby we flip the ratio and the lower the number, the cheaper the ratio. One advantage of price to book or book to market is that generally speaking, book value tends to be way less volatile than earnings because earnings tend to fluctuate a little bit more with the business cycle. So for a long-term investor, targeting price to book may make sense if the goal is to reduce the amount of trading or rebalancing frequency. Additionally, if a company has no or negative earnings, then price to book is one of the only other metrics that can help you establish some sort of framework for valuing a company. But that leads me to my main problem with using something like price to book for valuing companies. And that is that this metric has really aged like milk. And that is because we live in more of a digital age. See, back in 1992, there was a case to be made that the company's physical assets, anything that's included in the balance sheet, would be representative of what the company could use to earn money. However, in this digital age, there are things such as brand value, human capital, and intellectual property that are the main assets that grow the company value or earnings. And these intangibles, as we call them, are not included in the balance sheet unless they're acquired. Therefore, price to book ignores this huge chunk of assets that generate earnings in the current and likely in the future economy. 
unless an investor is implementing a cigar butt strategy. Targeting assets doesn't make as much sense as targeting earnings. So instead of targeting the assets that have the potential to create earnings, why not just target the earnings directly? In fact, many of the so-called value investments when using book to market could have zero profits, be losing money, be heading to bankruptcy and overall have terrible quality while still looking pretty good on a book to market basis. In fact, price to book is one of the few valuation metrics that largely ignores the quality of a company. Let's see how price to earnings could help alleviate this problem. Okay, so price to earnings is a pretty good starter to include, you know, earnings or the things that value investors should actually care about. And earnings per share in this case, first of all, is an accounting number and secondly, is only available to equity holders. And this number you will find at the bottom of an income statement as it accounts for all the things. It's what's left over after cost of goods sold, SG&A, depreciation, amortization, interest, taxes, the whole thing. So first of all, this is a pretty good no-brainer metric that generally market participants like using. And that is because it's simple and it has a little bit more of a quality tilt versus something like price to book. However, there are a couple of things to consider. First of all, if earnings are negative or zero, PE doesn't really make sense. You should use something else. And in that case, something like price to book could help. The second thing to consider is that earnings per share can be manipulated a little bit more easily as compared to other metrics that are more pure from an accounting standpoint. And this could be a huge issue when accounting for the quality of a firm. So adjustments need to be made. A quick fix to this issue would be to target incomes that are closer to the top line in an income statement. And that's where enterprise multiples come in. Here's Alpha Architect, CEO and CIO, Wes Gray, explaining why enterprise multiples are potentially a better measure of value. So I like to invoke the great Ben Graham when it comes to value investing and thinking about value investing. And he often says that investing is most intelligent when it's most business-like. And for me, a focus on enterprise multiples is more business-like than priced earnings, which is not necessarily a bad choice relative to other valuation metrics like price to book, for example, but it's not our preferred choice. Why do we like enterprise multiples? And why is it more business-like? Well, let's first focus on EBIT or operating income, which is a key component of an enterprise multiple. Operating income is great because it is simple and not as prone to manipulation via financial engineering or capital structure decisions. So let's break down operating income into its simplest form. Well, we're going to take revenues minus off the cost of goods sold, minus off SG&A, and voila. We now know what this firm earns at a high level before any sort of financial engineering or manipulation. And with earnings, if we wanted to go there, we'd have to move further down that income statement, which means more complexity, more potential for manipulation, and more issues potentially tied with capital structure. All of this is just gonna muddy the valuation picture. So you might have a company that might look wonderful on earnings, has great earnings, but it could literally be an interest rate payment away from bankruptcy. With operating income, we're gonna know how profitable and how strong this firm is before we get into the weeds. And so the reason we like operating income is you kind of get a two for one benefit. We can assess the relative cheapness of a firm or security versus its peers, but we also can assess the top level firm profitability. So to summarize, while we think price to earnings is a valid valuation metric, and to be frank, it's often going to be highly correlated with enterprise multiples, at the margin, we like valuation metrics such as enterprise multiple because they are simpler to understand and not as subject to income statement manipulation. In the 2009 paper, new evidence on the relation between the enterprise multiple and average stock returns, the authors proposed using enterprise multiples because operating income is not affected by non-operating gains or losses. As a result, operating income before depreciation can be viewed as a more accurate and less manipulable measure of profitability than net income, allowing it to be used to compare firms within as well as across industries. And both EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, and EBIT can be used in enterprise multiples. So now that we know that EBIT is a more pure measure 
that is not as prone to manipulation, then we need to establish what price we're gonna pay for that EBIT. However, it would be inappropriate to compare EBIT to the share price because EBIT is a number that is available to all providers of capital, not just shareholders. Instead, we need to take into account all providers of capital and act as if we were gonna purchase the entire firm. And for that, we are going to use total enterprise value. It is the market cap of both debt and equity. So when acquiring a firm in its totality, an investor would have to pay not just the equity holders, but also the debt holders, buy the preferred shares and pay off any minority interests. But because you've bought this company, then you get to subtract cash. And well, that's pretty simple to understand. You own that cash by buying the firm. So how has an enterprise multiple portfolio performed compared to something like a book to market one? Well, the aforementioned paper finds that from 1963 to 2009, the enterprise multiple factor generated 0.44% in return per month with a 4.1 T value of statistical significance, while the HML high minus low factor, which is again based on book to market, generated 0.42% with a 3.34 T value of statistical significance. Additionally, the enterprise multiple factor outperformed the HML factor both in recession and non-recession months. So while past performance does not guarantee anything about future returns, it is important for a value investor to ask the question, what is it that I'm actually buying and how can I measure that best? That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. As always, make sure you like and subscribe, but more importantly, you shared this video with a friend. If you want more content like this, make sure to go to alphaarchitect.com slash subscribe and there make sure to subscribe to the blog to dive deep into our educational resources. You can also go to at coffee hour on TikTok and Instagram and follow me there.